Okay, let's go back to ancient Egypt again. And I want to tell you about the Osiris myth. So don't lose the thread here. All of these things that they were trying to do is really to escape to a mythical afterlife. So it's all about the alien cortexes wrestling with this idea that it just cannot stomach. And that's the idea of mortality and death. And these are the kind of machinations that went through in the ancient world to try and get out of the inevitable, to in, try and uh, reach immortality and defeat death, defeat Mother Nature's plan and supersede its own plan. But in the course of this grand escape plan and all the scheming and religion, the actual cure for the alien cortex did crop up. So let me go through it with you top to bottom and start with the Osiris myth. T to start off with, there are three gods. Uh, that's Isis, think of her as the mother goddess, uh, the Virgin Mary later, and Sibylle, Ishtar. They're all the same personality, but in ancient Egypt, uh, she was called Isis. Now she's the brother of Osiris and also the consort. So incest going on there. And then there's the god Set, the god of disorder and chaos, uh, uh, a dark, malevolent god. And I think we have to, for our intents and purposes, just assume that Set is a representation of the alien cortex. So Isis then would be your mammalian brain, and Osiris is really your identity, your consciousness. Um, so your your true essence, let's let's say. Let's just pretend there is such a thing. So it's all about how Set comes to rule uh, the kingdom of Egypt, and that just means the whole world. So the alien cortex comes to dominate our whole world. So how he came to sit on the throne is he tricked Osiris. Um, Osiris was tricked into getting into a box. Now you remember your alien cortex loves to put things in a box. It's, you know, labeling, imprisoning, buttonholing, everything to get control. But I, ideally, uh, everything's got to be put in a glass case, uh, just like a butterfly. Uh, and so that uh, symbolizes control over death. Uh, that's the best it can do is instead of getting into a coffin itself, it puts everything it can into a coffin instead of itself. The old ploy of substitution again, which is one of its favorite tricks. So that's exactly what Set managed to do. He managed to substitute Osiris for himself, the alien cortex, and put Osiris in a box. Uh, as soon as Osiris was in a box, then he got chopped up. Kind of think of that as uh, atomizing you, or atomizing your attention, uh, scattering you. Scatter it's a metaphor also for scattering the people. It's what happened in the 20th century, how the alien cortex atomized uh, the primate brain and uh, our social networks. And it's about duality and separation and the end of oneness or wholeness. And now we're all individuals. We're just passed through the century of the ego or the individual which is the 20th century and we're paying the consequences now in the 21st century but think of that as Osiris being scattered. In the complex symbology of the ancient Egyptians Isis then sets about finding the scattered pieces of her husband Osiris she reassembles the body just long enough to procreate with him and have a son Horus Horus sets out to avenge his father and to defeat Set. Now, the great battle between Horus and Set is a battle for immortality. It's a battle over the forces of destruction represented by Set and your alien cortex. So it's a battle kind of of good or evil. It's uh, whether the alien cortex is going to be subdued and overthrown from his throne, ruling the world. Kind of the situation that we find ourselves in today. So the battle commences and it runs and runs for 80 or more years. And there are many, many episodes in this mythology. But one of the key elements, one of the key battles is crucial from the point of view of meditation. By the way, all of this is just code. So I'm giving you the code uh, so that you can decode the hidden meaning behind it. And what this code is about the supreme battle, this one episode, 
uh, that's crucial between the Battle of Horus and Set um, is goes something like this. Set asks Horus if he can sodomize him, which means he asks consent to dominate him. Horus in the battle strategically agrees if he can have some of Set's power. So Set agrees and Horus is sodomized. Now what Horus did strategically was to catch Set's semen in his hands and use it against Set. Now this takes some explanation. So the first thing to understand is that for the ancient Egyptians semen was something almost like a radioactive material. It was considered highly potent and poisonous even to the touch. So what Horus is doing here is he's taking Set's power, his, his essence, and he's catching it and using it against Set. So as the story goes then, uh, Isis, his mother, Horus's mother, helps him out by putting uh, Set's semen on a lettuce leaf and feeding it back to Set. In other words, poisoning Set. Now the crucial thing about this is that it gives Set uh, the Aten, solar disk, on his forehead. And by now I'm sure you'll understand what that symbology is. It's the Ajna, the third eye that I've been talking about, the phosphines behind your eyes. And so it's all a metaphor or code for initiates to teach them really about meditation. So, okay, now let me just describe what's going on with the lettuce and the semen and that kind of thing. Now, you may think it's rather strange to you know have a salad play such a central role in this myth okay the the lettuce has been used since ancient times and you must think of it more like a, a remain lettuce so it's standing proud and very phallic kind of like the cucumber building in london and if you cut the stem of a remain lettuce uh, then you will see that it kind of has a milky substance which they assumed was analogous to, to semen. So the romaine lettuce itself was considered an aphrodisiac. So the sexual energy is being transmuted to give Set the Aten or the solar disk, your third eye. So the lettuce is considered a sex symbol to the ancient Egyptians and it's associated with the god Nim. So Nim is ichthyophallic god, that means he has a huge stonking great penis and He's uh, known as a great god of love. So, okay, now let me unpack all of this for you. What it's all about is an initiate through sexual abstinence can build up all this kind of mojo, uh, sexual energy. And that sexual energy then can overflow into kundalini and rise up your spine. So through uh, abstinence, you can transmute all the sexual energy you build up into this kundalini or shakti energy which goes up your spine. So then in Tantra you have going up your spine presumably three nerves. Um, they're called nadi which means pipes or, or nerves and they're supposed to conduct this energy or prana up your spine. Uh, this is kundalini, shakti energy. So there's the ida, pingala and shushuma and shushuma is the the main one but it's basically the pudendal nerve in Western physio physiology. And what uh, you're doing is basically getting all the sexual excitement and energy, transmuting it so it flows up your spine. If it gets to your head, then it's presumably supposed to uh, lead you to samadhi and moksha. That means complete release from bondage, from, from this earthly bondage is, is the way they, they see it. So the same applies in Egypt. So if you think I'm making all this thing up about the spine and stuff like that, well, you should have a look at the Jed Pillar. So Osiris's spine is called the Jed Pillar and the Jed Pillar is really just a, a spinal column and it's a symbol that's very, very prevalent throughout ancient Egypt. And it represents this escape route uh, of energy up the spine uh, to get to 
the solar disk, the Aten, which you now know is just the phosphenes in front of your eyes. Okay, how are we to interpret all this weird mythology? Well, it's clues, it's code for initiates, people in the know, uh, of how to get to the afterlife. So, it's really the alien cortex's machinations trying to defeat death and trying to wheedle out uh, to reach immortality somehow, uh, to subvert nature's plan and substitute its own get out of jail plan. So that's essentially what it is. The way to look at all of this mythology is to see it as kind of like the Egyptians were on this weird trip. It's kind of like they thinking in terms of an LSD trip. And if you've been to Egypt and you've seen some of these ancient Egyptian monuments, they really are going nutty. They leave you in no doubt that this is a very sick primate. It's going nuts. And what it's going nuts about is its own death. So it's coming up with these schemes uh, to get out of its, its death. I mean, it's not going to work, but what comes out of it is really the solution to the problem. Uh, and I'll come to that. But in the meantime, think of the Egyptian mythology as having this weird primitive kind of logic. And I'll go through the logic of it for you. And it gives you a clue to what people were trying to do with meditation. And then that'll lead on to, hey presto, the solution was found in this madcap scheme for getting out of death. So the first thing to note is this idea of semen and longevity through, say, let's say ha through having children, through progeny. So the way to see it is, this is the weird kind of logic that I'll kind of lead you through. But it's something like this. The Egyptians are thinking that you're here. This is your essence, somewhere around your head. Now they're assuming that to have children and uh, propagate as nature intended, then some of your essence, your spirit, has to come down your spine and they're doing, you know, basic anatomy and they figured out, well, it must be coming down your spine and out your penis. And then that's w exemplified by semen. Now, they didn't know anything about embryos, so they think of a woman as and a womb as a kind of vessel. So the semen goes in there and then you get reborn as children. But it's not a very satisfying reincarnation. It's for your alien cortex. It's like, yeah, okay, I get to live on as my progeny, but that doesn't really cut the mustard. It's, it's not my progeny I want to live on. It's me, me, I'm the one. I'm the one that doesn't want to die. So that's what it's all about. And it's, it's thinking its way through. So it's thinking, think through the linear logic like an alien cortex in ancient times. It's thinking, okay, this is how it normally works. I have this kind of pseudo-immortality through children, but how do I get me, me, I must survive? Well, they're kind of thinking that you give up some of your essence. It's kind of like the Horcrux in J.K. Rowling's uh, Harry Potter. So, uh, Voldemort, you know, cuts himself into seven Horcruxes and spirits them away. And then and kind of they're thinking in that in those terms when you have children. You kind of give up part of your essence or brain or spirit and it goes into your children. I guess if you have too many children you'll be left like a zombie uh, on this logic. But anyway, not all of it holds together in our kind of rational and reductionist logic. This is kind of acid trip logic. But in essence now, Think of how you achieve immortality. Well, instead of doing nature's plan where you propagate your spirit through semen uh, into progeny, you reverse it. You do a little twisty twist and you withhold your semen and drive it back up. So up your spine. This is called raising the Jed. So what the Jed is, is Osiris's spine. It's a very, very common symbol in ancient Egypt, the Jed column. And this is all about raising the Jed column. Raising the Jed column was about achieving uh, resurrection and an afterlife, a continuity for yourself, your own ego, your own alien cortex into an afterlife. So then what they're thinking then is instead of emitting your semen, you hold it in and you draw it back. 
if you can draw it up your spine, they knew from the shamanic experience that it emphasizes the phosphines behind your eyes. That's the Aten, the solar disk. And now if you look at the third eye and chakra, the phosphines behind your, your eyelids, you'll see that it looks like a tunnel. These continual references to going into a tunnel in near-death experiences are really because people don't know. They're just looking at their own phosphines. They're not used to it. And then the first thing they see is that, oh, it looks like you're going through a tunnel. Now, putting this all together, you can see that if your semen goes into a womb, it comes out through a birth canal, which is a kind of a tunnel. Now, follow through on the logic. You're trying to do a reverse birth. The black satanic ritual of a birth and so this is how you're going to escape so then you can see in this third eye it looks like a birth canal so it all starts to make this weird kind of primitive sense that there must be a corresponding birth canal that your spirit can go through and then it doesn't have to die so then you're going through another birth canal instead of the normal human one in the female body you take the spiritual path into the third eye and that leads you out of the celestial dome which is really think of it as a big womb so it's kind of like the Truman Show and we're in this big fake world the simulation this is a big womb uh, and think of a bowl the sky is kind of like a bowl over the top they thought of it as a basket uh, it's and there's old uh, Nut, the sky goddess. Um, I'll come back to that, but uh, really she's the Milky Way. So anyway, they are thinking in these terms that you can do a Truman show. You can uh, make your escape out of the dome, and there they know it. They have the, the key. It's it's this uh, third eye. You can see basically the phosphines are in a circle. It looks like a tunnel. You go through that tunnel, and that must be the exit. Hurrah! completely nutty. Uh, it's all nonsense from stem to stern. But nonetheless, uh, this is a good selling point for the alien cortex. And yeah, I guess it reduces death anxiety. One of the things they were doing with it was getting control over the pharaohs. So the priests were getting control over the pharaohs. So by selling him all this really baloney stuff about you know, Mart's feather and the weighing of the heart and making sure that he's kept order and chaos. It's, it's really a devious trick to keep tyrannical pharaohs in line and so that tyrant priests can rule instead. And you can see that in some of the temples uh, in ancient Egypt. If you go and look behind the altars, they have priest holes. And what the priests were doing was they were crouching down inside the priest holes. Then the pharaoh would come up and uh, to maybe a statue of Osiris or Set. Um, and then he would consult the god in statue form. And the priests would mumble some mumbo jumbo and the pharaoh would think he was talking <laughs> to the god himself and this went so far that they actually had some statues with articulated jaws <laughs> so, so that's how dumb the pharaohs were but anyway this is how the priests kept control so it's basically the two um autocrats the the you know church and state and they come they have this kind of co-opetition between them and uh the the Priests could never totally rule without the, you know, the gangsters, uh, the pharaoh and his army. And the gangsters can never really rule without having the authority of the afterlife and all this very, very dubious cosmology that keeps all the people in line. And so that, in essence, is what's happening. Now, in the process of doing this meditation and taking initiates through this uh, course, which is ostensibly to negotiate the afterlife, they stumbled on the solution, even way back in shamanic times. And that is that if you can actually get this shakti, this uh, energy up your spine, up the pudendal nerve, uh, you get it to feed back. And when it feeds back, it gets to your brain and really you kind of blow a circuit. In other words, it, you have to think of it in terms of like a um, uh, frontal lobe uh, seizure, say a grand mal seizure for a frontal lobe epileptic. And that's, that's in essence what it feels like. And ironically, that's the solution to the whole problem. Because what that does is it completely blows your worldview. 
that expansive mind-opening feeling, uh, more than a feeling, uh, it's really something you can't come back from. And that is what destroys the ego, it destroys the alien cortex, and that solves the entire problem. Because then you no longer fear death, you no longer have to be resurrected, you no longer care about an afterlife. You know that you're going to die and it doesn't matter because after you've had this expansive mind experience, uh, everything else seems so petty. Even death seems petty after that. So it's easy to cope with death. And so then the, the strain of the true knowledge of it's all about defeating your alien cortex runs parallel with this theme of religion and uh, all these archetypes. So then, as I said, then the, the was scepter, it's really your spine. You can see the fork on the top is really your rocker on the top of your spine. And uh, the solar, the, well, the kind of head um, on the was scepter is uh, your sacrum bone uh, right at the end of the spine. Now it's upside down and inverted because it's hinting that the afterlife is inverting the normal process of procreation. So you have this uh, satanic ritual um, of anti-creation and that's how you're supposed to get to the afterlife and get resurrected. Some of this is still preserved right down to the present day in esoteric Freemasonry. The highest card in a deck of playing cards is the Ace of Spades, or what's commonly known as the Death card. In Freemasonry, the symbol of mortality is represented with a spade, a coffin, and an open grave. Manly P. Hall, a well-known researcher into mysticism, said that the spade is actually our sacrum bone. And he mentioned that the highest degree in Freemasonry is the 33rd degree, which matches the 33 vertebra in your spinal column, for good reason. Absolute nonsense, but it comes down and filters down to us even to this day through stuff like Christianity and in, in the New Age cults, are they still on about all this, this nonsense. But it's completely unnecessary if you know that Doing these things can lead to samadhi, this uh, explosion of, of your, your ego. So, does that make you completely one with the universe? No, all of that stuff is kind of hokum too. You see, what people are saying is you, you get these new age hippies and then they, uh, you can go to Egypt, you can see them round, round the pyramids in Giza and they're all sitting with their arms out there going home and trying to, you know, take in the vibrations and this knowledge and feeling one with everything. And it's, it's like what they're feeling is a connection with everything. But this experience, what I'm explaining to you is something quite different. It's really what, it's almost certainly what Socrates was talking about in the vastly misunderstood um, analogy of the cave. So once you come out of the cave up into the sun, that's the art and the solar disk, uh, really the third eye, uh, just phosphenes. What it's doing is it's putting a stress on your pineal gland. Your pineal gland produces DMT in that stressful situation and that gives you a, a trip. Um, so, yeah, if you're not knowledgeable, you assume it's a genuine trip to the afterlife. Otherwise, you know damn well that it's, it's just, a, just a molecule. Um, you're just a human being, uh, just a primate, and it's just primate physiology, nothing to get excited about. But the experience of it from the inside is not like a connection, so I feel connected one to everything. That's still an ego experience. You're still thinking, I'm me, there's this world, and I'm feeling connected to the world. It's all bogus, all hokum, just more, uh, just wallowing in this overprivileged, um, over egotistical uh, tragedy of the century of the self the century of the ego, the 20th century, and we're just hang, just spoiled brats that carries over today for more self-importance. Um, but I must qualify this now, because the self-importance of the real connection is so huge that it beggars belief. So the real connection, what this really means about emerging out of Socrates' cave, um, the allegory of the cave is about solipsism.
So solipsism is more than a connection with the whole. Uh, it really feels something like this. It really turns your whole world inside out. So if you imagine it's something like this, in the normal course of events, the average normie is walking around. They feel that they are a person. They're about five foot ten. They have a name and a body, and they're walking around with other people in this world, and they're just one person of many. And it's kind of like a full immersion experience in a virtual reality world, and they're kind of tootling about. Well, what this experience is uh, blows that completely away, and so it's kind of folded inside out. Suddenly, their whole mind is the virtual reality experience. So Truman's whole virtual dome, suddenly he's in his own head. So imagine it as, say, the magic school bus or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and you get shrunk down to a little atom and you go woof into your own head. Then the sky and the dome is really your cranial dome, and you become a little atom wandering around this virtual world inside your own head. You're walking around in your own dream. So you are the dreamer, and you are the little atom in the dream. But the world is inverted, so you are something, the world is dreaming, and you are that world. Does that make sense to you? Probably not. But anyway, solipsism is hard to understand, and it's uh, filled with... Uh, erroneous misconceptions. Now, you can't stay in that solipsistic state. As Plato mentioned uh, in Socrates' cave, you, you have to come back down into the cave, and you have to meet other people, and you have to kind of forget what you've seen. Because if you are the dreamer of this dream, and then people walk up to you, you go, hey, Joe, I'm just dreaming. You know, you're a dream I'm having. Joe's pretty much going to say to you, sod you, I'm not chopped liver, you know. If anything, you're in my dream. So there is this weird thing where we are dreaming each other's dream. And yeah, you, you have to come back down to earth and just accept, okay, everybody can have this expansive experience. Um, at the end of the day, we are just primates. And this is just something weird that DNA does on its way to energy equilibrium or something. But yeah, the thing is to understand that after this, you don't really care about death. And that's the important thing. If you don't care about death or, or dying, um, then we've all won. Then we can do without culture. We can do about this engineering. We can do about without industrialization. We can do without killing the planet. Um, all of these things are our effort. Uh, to try and stay alive for as long as we can. And the more we try and do it, the more we screw it up. And now it's getting really, really bad. We're onto things like CRISPR, which is a gene therapy or uh, genetic engineering for ourselves. Um, and we really are disappearing up our own asses. Um, so we're disappearing up our own asses from so many angles, from the angle of uh, our culture, from geoengineering, all the stuff that we're trying to do to save the planet is really just more of this psychotic uh, kind of journey that really starts in ancient Egypt on this kind of LSD trip to try and engineer your own immortality. And we're still at it. We're still at it. People just cannot let go and accept that you die. Uh, and then what's the casualty? Well, now the conventional way of having progeny and continuing ourselves uh, through children and future generations, we've sacrificed that. So in terms of trying to save our skin, our alien cortex has screwed it up so that now our kids, our generations to come, are going to be cut short because of this complete insanity. Too late now. There's, there's no going back. We've cooked our goose, and I think there are too many points of runaway in the system. So, yeah, they... You see, now that everybody's up against the wall and we might be coming to species extinction, then yeah, there might be a mass enlightenment. But it's kind of pyrrhic because the cost of that is the whole globe. So to achieve our little enlightenment, to realize that, hey, you don't have to fear death. And, you know, that, that has cost us this planet. Way too high a price. Um, but it's too late. Um, We've, we've run up a bill that we just can't pay. And 
we started paying that, uh, we started running up that bill in the ancient world uh, with things like the ancient Egyptian religion. So this uh, continual theme of uh, near-death experiences and people coming back and then reporting that they can see this tunnel, often a tunnel of light, it is just the phosphines and it gets enhanced by DMT. So nobody has really experienced death. No animal experiences death. And the reason is because you're just halfway through it and then you go and die. So all these near-death experiences and these reports coming back like these books like uh, Anita Majari and Dying to Be Me. It's all just rather precious ego uh, saying, you know, oh, we don't really die. Uh, we carry on somehow because I had a near-death experience and this is what I saw and it's all bunk. So from time immemorial, I think people were coming back from the dead. So in other words, you you would have Og would be sideswiped by a mammoth and it looked like he was dead and then he would come back to life, Lazarus-like, and then they'd say, what happened? And he would tell them, well, I went into this tunnel, I went into the light, because he's looking at his own phosphines, he just doesn't know what phosphines are. And so they report back what it's like to have a, a DMT trip because a pineal gland is under stress and it's emitting DMT spontaneously. And so then they report this like, this is what happens to you when you die. Well. Yeah, it is what you happens, happens to you what, when you die, but the near-death experience is nonsense because nobody, no animal really experiences death, and there is nothing on the other side of death, so there's nothing to report back on. But what they're doing, uh, you know, selling these books, and what they're doing in the ancient religions, and the priesthood, and all the religions we've inherited that have caused so much damage, uh, they are really reports from the afterlife, giving your ego courage and hope that there might be something after it's snuffed out. There isn't. There, there wasn't anything before. Anything you can imagine before is just in your imagination. And anything that comes after is also nonsense. Basically, the lights go on and then they go off. It's a great mystery of the universe, but that really is how it is. It's far more mysterious than you go on and you perpetuate as a soul in heaven or something. No, it's, it is indeed far more mysterious that the lights go on, you have this life and then the lights go out and that is it. That, that is the only way you get to experience this world and this planet. And uh, yeah, there is, there is no continuity of your ego. Your ego evolved and merged out of your neurons and your neurophysiology. And when the neurophysiology disappears, uh, so does your alien cortex, so does your consciousness. They all disappear. And if you find that really hard to understand, then uh, just do an experiment. Get 10 tots of whiskey and line them up in front of you on the bar. Knock them back one by one and you'll see your consciousness will go down. Alien cortex will disappear, then you'll get all pally as you get to the primate brain. And then you might get to the mammalian brain and then you love everybody. And then you get down to the reptilian brain and you start fighting with everybody at the bar or you try and you know, have sex with everybody at the bar or you get the munchies. And, and then, boom, one more tot and it's lights out. And yeah, when you revive, you have some residual memory uh, of what it might have been like to be blacked out. And there's some uh, really sense of a passage of time. But that's only because your, your neurons are ticking over and you are laying down some memory track. But when your neurons are no longer firing, you're not laying down any memory track. And then there really is a complete separation um, and you're gone. And that is the fate for all of us. So. That's the bit that we just cannot accept. And um, yeah, it degrades our life and it ultimately makes us extinct. So get over it, get over it. So anyway, if you're into Ken Wilber and spiral dynamics and you think this is all to do with, you know, becoming teal and nah, it's, it's not really any of that. The, the Ken Wilber thing, you know, from dust to deity, it's just more of this in, insanity. Um, yeah, we, we're a deity because we're conscious, but a deity is a meaningless concept. And it's far better to think of us as dust to dust than dust to deity. Um, all of this is, is more insanity. This idea, you know, the Ken Wilber ideas that suddenly this is all part of a big plan and it all comes together and uh, we reach a tipping point and a phase change into this new reality. And it's like, 
yeah, we reach a tipping point and a phase to change into a new reality. That reality is called extinction and death. This is nothing to, uh, to aggrandize. It's a tragedy. And it's the same with the, you know, the singularity, the technical sin singularity, what they call the, the rapture of the nerds. That we all, coming to this point, this is all part of a grand teleology, that we get to this predestined place where everything uh, gets revealed. This is the book of Revelation. And suddenly everything becomes revealed. We all understand it. It all has purpose. And we open into this new eternal immortality. Not going to happen. It's not, this, this formula uh, is not predestined to work out. This crucible is not predestined to ferment uh, the alchemy of immortality. By messing with this alchemy, we've only achieved extinction, not immortality. So a massive tragedy, but it's, it's not too late to get sane now. You know, it's, it's, there's still time to have a moment of clarity and sanity and get over all this, this insanity of this, you know, magic world and magical thinking. Uh, the world is magical enough and you don't need to aggrandize it. You don't need something else other than what we have. What we have, if you just think about it, is, is so bizarre. It's unspeakable. The, the world as it appears to be, the mundane world, is unspeakably bizarre. So you really are gilding the lily coming up with these things like an afterlife and other realms and you know, points of singul singularity where you know, we head into this new plane of existence. We don't. <laughs> the lights go out. And that's what's sad about it. That's, that's, that's the grief of it. But you have to get to a point of sanity or just die insane. And I would like to see people as many as possible, go out sane. The ripeness, the ripeness is all.